Hi, welcome to the Real Estate of Mind Show. We're your host, Glenn and Amber. Hey, everybody. Where we help everyday people create wealth through real estate investing. We have a hot topic today. <laughs> Contractors. So uh, let's get rolling. Yep. So contractors has really been my world since we got going. I mean, yes. both of us have certainly dealt with it, but you no, know, you in, dealt with a lot. You were better than I was at it. Did I we, was tougher on them <laughs> than you were. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't so good. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was but, the good cop. Yeah, I was definitely the bad cop. Yeah. So you know, we've we've definitely we, had a love hate relationship. We should with clarify that before we here. go in, because because it, it was people always, people assume, which is wrong. People always assume that well, Amber is the woman, so she's the broker and does all the sales, and Glenn does all the contracting and building. No, I don't. That's not my thing. Ever's a designer and she managed all the contractors. I did all the buying and selling. So it was very opposite. So people were very confused all the time and they constantly would walk up to and talk to me all the time at the job site. I'm like, I don't know, talk to her. And they would like talk to her. And then two minutes later, look over at me again. I'm like, hey, dude, talk to her. Came out a director, but that, that was our role. So Amber... Yep. And became the boss out there and took care of those contractors and whipped them into shape. So she's and got lots of stuff. That's important if you are doing this as a partnership with a spouse or a par any partner that you have is to always elevate the other person and yeah. let them handle their roles. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like I said, we've definitely had love-hate relationships with our contractors over the years. Yep. And they're, not all of them are bad. So this no. is not a contractor bashing session. That's very true. Um, but they are hard to come by. And when you're looking for a, a contractor, there's three things you want to look for. And these are in no particular order because they are all important. But you want to look for price, you want to look for quality, and you want to look for timeline. So I'll tell you right now, pick two. That's all you're going to get. <laughs> Try any combination. That's all you're going to get is two. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you have a good price and a, and a good timeline, then your quality is going to suffer. Right. If you have good quality and a good price, then your budget's going to suffer. Your, your timeline's going to suffer. Your timeline's going to suffer. Yeah. So That was the three things. The budget wasn't one of them. What? Well, I guess it was what I was Talk to the hand. Um, so, you know, rarely will you find all three in a contractor. And if you, contractor, and if you do, you know, treat them like gold. Yeah. And the other thing is um, contractors seem to have a shelf life, too. Yeah, that's interesting. We've noticed that over doing this for however many years or over a decade. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I think they're contractors for a reason. They don't like to work for the same person over and over and over. Feels like, um, feels like a job tool. Right. And then the other thing is sometimes they get greedy. You know, if you, let's just throw arbitrary numbers out. Let's say you buy a house for $100,000, um, you pay them $30,000 in renovation, and then you sell it for $200,000. They automatically do the math in their head and think, they just made $70,000 and I only got paid thirty. dollars You or, like my voice or, there? <laughs> or they, for, yeah, that guy was interesting for us. <laughs> so I think that they forget. Sometimes they say, well, you paid hundred and sold it for, you made 100000 You bought it for hundred and sold it for two hundred. Did you forget your fee and the material yeah. fees and the, you know, they don't, they just don't. The buying and selling costs, the holding costs, They all just, stuff. they assume that you make the lion's share of that money when you don't. I mean, right. and, and plus, they don't take any of the risk. I mean, right. They're getting paid to do, they take a little risk because you're, not not really, then you're paying them when they get their work done, so. But they do that simple math in their head and then all of a sudden they're, they think they're justified in like jacking their rates up. Yeah, and, you it, know. it creeps up too. Yeah. Every job a little higher until you have to keep them back down. And right. yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a constant game, constant game. So, you know, we could go on and on about this subject, but today we're going to focus <laughs> just on the budget aspect of it, just on the price and, okay. and also how to protect yourself um, from it. You know, you want to have the right paperwork in place, the right yep. kind of, of contracts in place, and they're never going to protect you 100%, but there's definitely certain um, contracts and, and conversations that you can have to at least help protect you with that. Yeah, there's legality versus reality. So the, the legality is that you have a contract in place and they're supposed <coughs> to do their part and you do your part. You could pay them in advance, do their thing and never do that. But let's say you did that and then you have a contract, they don't show up, you say, hey, I have a contract. So what? Yes, you, it's enforceable. You could go to court, spend time, money. You could even get a judgment and odds are you'll never get a penny out of that person. Right. So there's legality versus reality, and you've got to learn how to make business decisions to move forward yep. to get your jobs done and to, and to protect yourself because the law is not going to, the law on paper will help you, but you'll never get a dime back out of that deal. So the law is not really going to help you in this case, but it's still good to have a contract because the good ones will honor their word and they'll honor what they sign. But, right. but by and large, 85 to 90% of them don't. Yeah. You know, but they, but there are there are a handful that are really good. So if you're watching this, we're talking to you. You're a good one. If you're, you know, if you're saying to yourself, hey, I'm, I'm a good one. Well, you'll know if you're a good one if you honor your word. 
You yeah. do what you say you're going to do and you honor your word and, and all that. That's how you know you're good. But even if you are a good one, you know, I don't want to get a bunch of hate mail for this for, from contractors. You know, there's no need to get defensive here because even if you are one of the good ones, you, you know, know exactly what yeah, I'm talking you know, about. Yeah, you know the bad ones. You totally know. <laughs> and, you know, we get a lot of people, a lot of contractors come to our home flipping workshop even. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we'll, we'll get some engagement from the crowd about that. And, you know, yeah, it, it all comes full, full circle, though. Yeah. Everybody knows what we're talking about there. So there's yeah. no need to get defensive on that because if you're a good one, that's great. Great. Um, but you do need to know, even as a good contractor, if you're interested in, in being a real estate investor, you need to know how to protect yourself from the bad ones. So let me tell you a story. So um, I'm going to tell you some of the stories today, and Amber can interject here. But um, we had a house we did in Saratoga early in our career, and we bought this house, did the renovation. It was right when the market had crashed. And so mm. we had to have a contractor. Remember this guy? So we had to have the guy come out. He was a builder. So he was somebody that was the builder and- um, New construction was like way down. Like there was no new construction going on. So he started getting into yeah. renovating houses. Yeah. So he came to the house, did the deal. He did a pretty good job for the yeah. renovation. He was, he was more, like a, more like a general contract. He was like subbing things out rather than do the work himself. But at the end he said, so, you know, I got a little few things left to do. And we were still pretty new. That was probably, it, that was less than 10 deals oh, yeah. we had done. That was probably our sixth or seventh house we had done maybe. And he said, listen, just, you know, pay me my final payment. Hold back 400 bucks because it'll only take me a couple hours to get this stuff done. Now, we're still kind of new, so we don't really realize that a couple hours in a contractor's mind means a several days. So we paid him. You think he came back? He did not. Nope. He skedaddled. Never heard from him again. He, was, he had a reputable name in the area, but the market was down. He was trying, and what he did, he was trying to make money for himself. <laughs> so... That 400 bucks in his mind wasn't worth it to come back. Now, if you're a person of integrity and you have honor and character, then don't don't bitch about this. And you, if you're the ones that comes back, then you're the one that comes back. That's great. But the ones who don't come back are the ones who say, "Well, the 400 bucks that's not worth my time to go out there for a day to do that." I can go on and move on to another job and get right. a deposit. Right. I go. Yeah. I go to no job. I get a deposit and I can work <clears> someplace <throat> else and make more money. When really you have to finish the contract. And how short-sighted is that too, though? Because he could have gone on another job of ours. Never, never hired that man again. Never nope. heard from him again. But we didn't pay him the four hundred bucks. But it cost us about two or three thousand dollars to have to somebody else it. come in to finish it because someone coming on somebody else's work is very difficult. So that that was a learning lesson for us is to not give the contractors that final payment. So I'll right. let Amber take back over. Exactly. So here's what we want to, the, the tips that we want to give you. I want to look at my notes here so I don't forget anything. First of all, never give your contractors money ahead of time. I'm going to talk about that for a second. Mm -hmm. um, we buy all the materials on our jobs, so we don't even give a contractor money up front. We give them 5% after they started, after they finished day one, as long as they did a good job on day one. And then we chunk it out in phases. You know, we have, I think, it's six phases. You know, it's demo and prep, and then it's rough in electrical and plumbing, and paint and flooring and yeah, all of, all of that kind of stuff. Our scope so, of work lays it out. Amber, Amber built an amazing scope of work that we use. Yeah, it, awesome. it really did help our business a lot because there's like benchmark dates when they should be completed by something by and then also how much they get at the end of each phase. <clears throat> so we developed that because what would happen is, you know, they would they would say, I'm, you know, 50% done with the job. So they expected a 50% payment. But it was hard to gauge that. It was hard to measure that. Yeah. So when we came up with that system of yeah, the you, phases. You, you've both got... You both got your own perspective on what 50% right. is. Right. Oh, oh the and owners always say no, no, and they're always saying, oh, yeah, yeah. And it's. But as know. someone brand new, it's hard to say, oh, yeah, the paint does look good. But then you're not thinking about all of, you know, the tri and the, the last 10% of the job. We'll talk about that in a minute in more mm -hmm. detail. But, um, you know, that's the part that seems like it takes the longest, all that trim and finish work. So, yeah. um, so we were, I was really strict on not paying the contractors until they, the, the work or the part of that phase was completed. And I would have a little leeway with that. You know, if I, if I could see that the paint, that phase, if that was 50% done, I might give a 50% payment. But, you know, like I was saying, they'd always come to him, Amber is a pay me, blah, blah, And <laughs> I'm like, do the work and I'll pay you. Yeah. I, got, I got better at saying, just talk to Amber, don't talk to me. I, I sleep with her, not with you, hopefully. 
So. <laughs> but I pay on completed work, not work that's going to be done. All right, the next one is make sure you have a structured pay schedule that's based on completed work. We kind of just, I got a little ahead of myself on that Sorry. one. Um, and then the third one is make sure you leave enough money at the end so they see it as a paycheck and want to, fin want to finish. Yeah, that was just, the exact problem that we yeah. had at that house was yeah. we didn't leave enough at the end. And that phase six payment needs to be a chunk. It needs to be, you know, 15 percent, 20 percent so that they want to finish the job and move on to the next one. So they want to come back and get that check. Right. That's an important part. I'm going, to tell you, I'm going to tell you a story in a minute that where I screwed up, but go ahead. So then the last thing is also know how to handle the change orders because it's inevitable. You know, even if you write a rock solid scope of work, there's going to be things that come up in the house that Always. you weren't anticipating. Always. I don't think we've ever done a project that didn't have something unanticipated yeah, it's show a Yeah, it's a renovation. Right. It's, it's not a new construction. Even new construction has things that come up, but renovations, right. there's always something that comes up, always. Absolutely. So you want to document those change orders, and on the scope of work, there's a place to do that. Document what those changes that are order, orders are, uh, how much you agree with the contractor that it's going to cost. In and advance. Then also, in advance. In advance, yeah. Not, don't let them do the work. They have to talk to you yes. before they start the, doing the, whatever the change order yes. is. You know, and then you need to negotiate that price, write it on the contract. And not only do you want to negotiate the price, but you also want to negotiate how long that change order is going to add to the job. You know, is it going to add a day? Is it going to add a week? Because that's going to change your bottom line too. Because in our contracts, what we have is we have a, <clears throat> we have a $100 penalty per day if you miss the deadline. So, you know, whatever, when they, they give a deadline, it's best to say, what, what, how long do you think it'll take me? Well, it'll take me four weeks. How about we give you six? Yeah. Give them, give them an extra, whatever, let them give a date. Let that, and as long as it's real, if they say six months, that's probably not the best, you that's know. It's not the right contractor. Right, if, yeah. If the job is really a four week job. <laughs> if they give a realistic time frame or even, even an aggressive timeline, give them 50% more. Well, it'll take me five weeks. How about we give you seven and a half? Oh. Okay, great. That I'll definitely have it done by then. Great. So seven and a half, that's our agreement. Now you should have no problem hitting the deadline. Then, like Amber said, as soon as they have a change order come up, well, we found there was plumbing here. We found there was asbestos. We found there was some mold. Um, that You want to add a wall there? What's it going to cost? Once you negotiate the price, you've got to make sure the days are on there because then you can adjust the deadline on the job. Yeah, and contractors, you know, many of them are very good at their craft. They're good at construction. They're good at the trim work. They're, they're good at their craft, but they're not always good business people. You know, they don't always think about how the costs add up. And so that, that ends up being a problem on job sites a lot of times because they'll get to Friday and they can't make payroll because, you know, the work hasn't been done yet. So sometimes you have to help them figure that out. And, and like Glenn was saying, if you give them a little extra time on the job, um, that can be helpful too. So I want to tell you a story about our office. If you've ever seen the picture, the before and after of our picture, we showed it at the workshops. We, we bought the worst house that was vacant for probably 15 or 20 years. It looked like a crack house. I yeah. mean, if, if you saw the Google images before, I mean, yeah. and, and it was held up by these two two by tens on the front porch. And I mean, it looked like if the wind blew the wrong way, the house would fall. Everybody apart. said that building has to be torn down. We walked inside and said, actually, the inside is square. The porch on the front needs to come off. That's what was leaning. And so everybody, so, you know, again, don't take everybody, don't listen to everybody else's advice. We yeah. walked inside and went, well, besides all the pigeon shit, there was every place in the house. We it said, had good bones. It did. It was straight and square. We said, huh. And we had plans for an office. It was the busiest road in our town. I think twenty or 30,000 cars a day go by this location. It's between a Walmart and a, and a Hannaford, you know, big, big names there. So anyway, so we bought this house to renovate it. It was a major renovation. I don't remember how much we spent, but it was a lot of money. A few hundred thousand dollars in renovation of this building. We turned an ugly house into a beautiful office that looks like a home, right? That's signature home buyers. That was kind of the whole theme. So we had a contractor on this job that was obnoxious. He got work done. That's putting it nice. He had a ton of people come in, but he started to not pay contractors. And that's something we should talk about too, is making yeah. sure that you're your sub, making sure their sub, you, I'll let you cover that but in your next section, but you know, the subcontractors need to be paid too so they don't put a lien on your property, that's important. So um, we were doing this job and a lot of work, we did foundation work and everything else, and the crew, the guy was doing a really good job at that point. However, he would get very obnoxious and very loud. And one day at the end of the job, I remember being winter time, and he came to me and said, look, I have to make payroll. And that's one thing I think we'll, we can cover now if you want, but we, you know, your job is not to make their payroll. They have to run their own, like Amber said, they're, they're not always great business people. So 
it's not your job to make their payroll. Your job is to pay when the job is completed. It's their job to make their payroll out of their own funds, right? If they're living paycheck to paycheck, that's not your, that's not your problem. Now, it becomes your problem, like this case I'm gonna share with you right now. The end of the job came, and this guy had a crew of people, and he had to make payroll. And it was $7,000. Well, ironically, the balance left in his contract was $7,000, or no, maybe $10,000. 10,000 left in the contract. It was a, a, a good sized contract of 50,000, 80,000, yeah, whatever it was. Yeah, we a lot of things commercial, so that cost more than doing yeah, residential. It may have been close and... to 80,000 versus fee. But whatever it was, I remember very specifically being in the office and him you know, whining, crying me a river about needing 7,000 payroll. I said, listen, you're not there yet. I, you know, I'm gonna leave at least you know, 6,000 or 7,000 on the job so you come back. I will come back, I'm a man of my word. I'm a man of my word up and down about what a man of his word is and blah, blah, blah. I'm trustworthy. And by the way, if someone has to tell you they're trustworthy mm -hmm. and tell you that they're a man of their word, eh, they're probably not, right? Usually you, you kind of know that by people you deal with. So against my better judgment, I said to him, I'm gonna give you this $7,000. You've got a week's worth of work left here. Don't you dare F me. Don't you dare. Do you understand me? Look me in the eye and tell me. I will not. No way will I do that. No way. What do you suppose he did the next day? I, I talked to one of his painters that night. I don't remember the conversation, but he said something like, I guess we're coming back tomorrow. I said, yep. Yeah. I said, yep. Yeah. I said, as long as your guy comes back. I said, I paid him a big check today, so you, you should get paid. And, uh, and I, you know, because some of the guys weren't getting paid. And so I said, I just paid your guy. You should be getting paid, and you guys are coming back tomorrow. Next day, or that night, call, or after he cashes the check, because that's what they do. They usually go to the bank and cash the check, right? They don't deposit it. Cash the check called me up one side and down the other. You talked to my guy. You told him you gave me a check. I'll pay him. That's just because you did that. I'm not coming back. I said, you're an asshole. You're an asshole. I said, that's exactly, that's exactly what I knew you were going to do. You're that kind of person. That's exactly what you just did. You just told me you weren't that kind of person, yet you just went out and did it. So I learned a valuable lesson. It cost us another 10 grand to get that deal done? Yeah, because then you have to hire a new contractor oh. and they have to kind of get caught up to speed oh. with everything. And then they find stuff that, you know, and, and pe contractors do things a little differently. So this contractor doesn't like what that one did. So they want to take it apart. You know, it just, it ends up being a nightmare. Yeah, we're just disgusted with the guy. So, it, you know, now it turns out, I know later on he went out of business. I'm sure he probably in jail someplace. He was that kind of a guy. But, you know, just because they give you their word, stick by your paperwork, stick by your guns. You have to do that. He was saying, if I don't get the money, I can't come back tomorrow. So that was the dilemma we were in, right? The dilemma was, if I don't get the money, I can't come back tomorrow. And I need to come back tomorrow. So that was my gamble, like, do I pay him? Will he come back tomorrow? If I don't pay him, he's not coming back tomorrow. If I do pay him, and then he said, well, you pretty much, well, you said something bad about me, so that hurt my feelings, so I'm not coming back. Oh, that's your reason? He just needed a reason not to show up and take the money and run. So yeah. he did. Like, like Lynn was saying, you I get a little angry about that guy, in case you can't tell. That's been a lot of years ago, but just... Those guys just, you know, after a while, they just, you get screwed enough times, you get really callous to it and get angry about it. So. Yeah, you'll hear every sob story in the book. I mean, it, you know, and it's kind of like if you were dealing with tenants, you hear every sob story in the book because they didn't want to pay their rent. Same yeah. kind of thing with contractors. You'll hear every sob story. You, you have to just get jaded and you pay on completed work. Yeah. And I've said it over and just over again, but dealing with contractors is a lot like dealing, you know, it's a lot like running an adult daycare. You know, you're constantly <laughs> making constantly. sure they stay in line. Yeah. And Glenn brought up the fact that, you know, you want to make sure that the that your GC, your general contractor, is paying their subs, because then if they don't pay their subcontractors, then that comes back on you and ends up being a whole other problem. And that's the, uh, the other importance mm -hmm. of having the right contracts and the right paperwork, because that's all laid out in there that they have to. Well, the contract, yeah, the subcontractor can actually lien your property. Right. The, sub, the sub can put a lien, even though you paid your contractor, the sub can lien your property, and you'll have to deal with that person if you want to sell the house. Right. So you want to make sure you stay protected and all of yeah. that. So let's recap. Okay. Um, first, never give contractors I'll calm money. down a little bit. I was a little excited there. I was a little <laughs> angry about that. All right, babe. You can have a glass of wine later. Good. Um, never pay your contractors Can we drink on a podcast? Time. Is that okay? Is that acceptable? <laughs> Is that okay if we do that? <laughs> Go ahead. I'm if sorry. we're talking about contractors, yes. I know. Um, you know, they... Bar none, dealing with contractors is the worst part about flipping houses. I was going to say the same exact you know word. What? I was thinking about people say, what's the hardest part? I always say contractors. Dealing with con contractors. It's still worth it. Yeah, totally. It's still worth it. Even it's with... Better than doing the work yourself. <laughs> totally. Yeah. <laughs> Breaking your own back. Yeah. So lesson learned, never pay your contractors ahead of the work. Because if you do, you will get screwed. Yeah. Maybe not the first time, maybe not the second time, but probably the next 
eight or ten times after that. Yeah, you do it enough, you you do you definitely get hurt. So. Um, and to do that, make sure you have a structured pay schedule that is outlined that they understand when they finish ABC, they get X Y Z, so that everybody's on the same page. Nobody's confused about what percentage of what job is done. Um, make sure you leave enough money at the end of the job. I think we've kind of nailed that into the ground. Can you tell I've been burned <laughs> on that one before? Seven thousand um, yeah. dollars. Yeah. And the thing about that is, had we not paid him that seven thousand yeah, dollars, he was going to walk off the job regardless, yeah. he, and we would have at least me. had that seven thousand dollars to pay the next guy. Yeah, he had me. Try and not let them get a hold of you. Try and stay. Try and stay on top of those relationships because even the best of us can lose to them. Yep. So. And then um, know how to handle change orders. Yeah. So you know, remember, you deserve the life that you dream of. I've said that in previous podcasts, but you deserve the life that you dream of. You have to take action to it, and there's going to be bumps, there's going to be ups and downs. I tell people, I say, you know, when you, when you, life is all about ups and downs. Life's all about ups and downs. But when you get into real estate investing, you'll think, oh, my problem's going to be solved. Nope, you're just going to add more ups and downs to your world. But the difference is the outcome can be so much greater with real estate investing. And the, in- the income. Well, yeah, the, 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 yeah. Out, the outcome. Yeah. What do you think about, when I said outcome, do you think I spent something else by income or? Well, that could, um, that's a big umbrella. Again, if you want to say my lines, that's fine too. <laughs> However you like, how to handle that, sweetheart. So there you go. So there you go. You go ahead and say it. I don't want to say your line, so go ahead. I'm all done. <laughs> all right. Ahead. You have been listening to the Real Estate of Mind show. We are your hosts, Glenn and Amber. And as always, if you liked what you heard here today, please write a nice review for us on iTunes and feel free to share it with anybody that you think could find value here. Make sure you look us up on social media and like us and follow us on Instagram and Facebook and mm-hmm. YouTube and all that good stuff. And again, if you have questions, make sure you pop them over to us so you can be covered on one of our future podcasts. Remember, Everyday people really do create wealth through real estate investing. The only question is, will you be next? So we hope everybody enjoyed this and we look forward to seeing you again next week. See you then.